stuff. Hey, are we live? I don't know. Welcome to maybe Nintendo stuff podcast. Welcome to maybe Nintendo We're stuff. live. Welcome to OPC. <laughs> We're professionals, guys. Welcome to Nintendo stuff podcast episode 66. My name is Brandon Miracle. We got Logan Wellover and Paul Anderson today on the Hello. show. And we've got a lot to talk about because we didn't go live last week. He <laughs> he, sorry. Um, I take most of the blame of that. I'm sorry, guys. I had to go to a wedding. No, it's not your fault. Other people decided to get married. Logan and I were going to do the show, and then I got sleepy, and then we never did. <laughs> that enough. seems to happen sometimes. All I'm saying okay, is though. sometimes your friends decided to get married on the weekend that Sonic the Hedgehog comes out in theaters. Yeah. Acceptable. That was not to mention not cool. that it was uh, Valentine's Day weekend. Yeah. I'm more upset about missing Sonic opening <laughs> day, but. You know. What's going on, Nintendo and Santi? Also, thanks for the uh, for the com compliments on the CRT. That's a new addition to the set. Yeah, we like to get creative over here at the Break Room Arcade, and uh, yeah, I'm just here to look really pretty. Jet. Santi says, "Logan, please don't woo again. You peaked, ow." Oh, uh, yeah. You hear that, Logan? You uh, so, peaked. Okay, so before we get into the games, I want to just express some OBS woes, uh, and that is some of the. I think the audio processing with OBS isn't great. Great. Uh, so even if I try my best to uh, tame the audio. Uh, with the given like plugins that they have it always seems like yeah we're gonna have to do some research because there's probably some extra pl plugins we could get that would work better yeah because these are just the baked in ones yeah and they work for a lot of things like uh, chances are nobody peaked like chances are if you look at the levels they never you know actually clipped yeah uh it's just the actual processing on the uh so I mean it made me a very defeated like audio guy trying to uh, wrestle with that kind of stuff. Okay, Logan, or, we believe in you. But like it, you know, like what if like you know the stuff like actually worked? Did you just take a picture? <laughs> Accidentally. It That's was, really funny. If it makes you feel any better, how many like people who use OBS have an audio guy that can like say, That's Oh hey, nice yeah, that's terrible. Why nice why is it like this? Yeah, we're kind of lucky that we have you. Yeah, I'm... I guess I'm lucky I have me, too. <laughs> Thanks for the compliment. <laughs> uh, uh, Nintendo says, The Speedy the Porcupine movie, with his famous catchphrase, I like to travel on a moderately decent, at a moderately decent speed. That sounds like my me kind too. of speedy porcupine. So I guess while we're on the subject, and since it's kind of the furthest back thing in our timeline of things to talk about, why don't we just start with Sonic the Hedgehog? 
What a good movie! It's kind of a good movie. The movie does things, and it actually turned out pretty good, and I was thoroughly entertained, and also Sonic was actually really, really good. It felt like Sonic. Yeah. Uh, one of the scenes that I constantly go back to in my mind is right at the beginning when we first get introduced to a teenage Sonic running down the highway holding a turtle. He and drops the turtle. He drops the turtles <laughs> to run back and go pick him up. Uh, it's great because this scene is not only like a great introduction to Sonic's personality, um, which is a little bit different than most people because he has spent most of his life uh, alone. Um, but uh, it also draws back to the original games because Sonic primarily saves uh, woodland creatures. And while a turtle isn't necessarily a woodland creature, it just kind of fits that vibe. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, that poor little turtle. He was he was shell shocked. <laughs> <laughs> just like the uh just like the little animation that after like he gets done running and puts him on the ground the turtle's like shaking as it's like crawling forward that was like the most adorable thing oh <laughs> uh, yeah that was super good one thing i really want to commend the movie on is how quickly we get to sonic this is not like Oh, this is the Smurfs, and it's gonna be 20 minutes before we finally see the Smurfs. We're not hiding you it from you. Sonic Dad and Sonic Mom, and they make Sonic Baby, and we have to. They gotta fall in love first before they can make Sonic Baby. It, it was nice to have one of these movies, you know, that features like a beloved mascot that just focuses like sorely on the mascot. So like, this is Sonic the Hedgehog's movie, not James Marsden plus Sonic the Hedgehog the movie. Well, you could maybe argue it was a Jim Carrey movie, but... Yes, but, you know, it should be because he played, you know, Dr. Robotnik. Um, also, Jim Carrey <laughs> really knocked it out of the park. Yeah, I also love the transformation of that character from something that's like... Uh, kind of recognizable, like he kind of looks like the traditional Robotnik, and then yeah. as the movie goes on, uh, he hi hops in, you know, his his little aircraft and mm -hmm. uh, really starts to mold into the role until you get to that like after credit scene. Yeah, you know? uh, that, this will be an after credit. This will be a spoiler discussion, by the way. So if you haven't seen the movie, just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, it was after the credits, yeah. but they did reveal that design in the in the very first trailer, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't know why they did that. They really should have held that under, you know, held that in their pocket. I'm going to guess that that would have been in, like another avenue for people to complain. He doesn't even look like Robotnik. Yeah, yeah so they had to throw like the most realistic, most realistic, most accurate representation in terms of like, oh, look, he's got this huge mustache. He's got the goggles. He's got the... You know, a red flight jacket. Well, I mean, when we get to that final design, like, I couldn't think of, like, a better live-action adaptation of what, you know, Eggman would look like. It really is spot on. I also really love the personality of the character, too, because, mm -hmm. like, before they even call him in, there's just, like, the two or three guys in the uh, the meeting that are just groaning, like, him? <laughs> Do we really have to call in him? I love that uh, even in the end, like, the the U.S. Department of Defense or, like, whoever it was, the Pentagon, I think, they were, like, they they thanked James Marsden's character and Sonic for getting rid of Eggman. <laughs> They're, like, we really didn't want to deal with that guy, so we'll just sweep this under the rug. Thanks for not saying anything. <laughs> like, yeah, we brought him in to try to do all this stuff, uh, and then apparently he was a little more trouble than it was worth, so thanks for cleaning up our mess. Yeah. So, uh, Jim Carrey is Dr. Robotnik. Uh, fantastic. I love Sonic's, you know, because, like, we have that thing here where Dr. Robotnik is Dr. Robotnik here in the U.S., in the original games, where his actual name is Eggman in the Japanese games, and they didn't start calling him Eggman here until we got to Sonic Adventure 1. So, in order to kind of play with that a little bit, they had Sonic come up with his name, Eggman, as a nickname for his Eggbots. Which was awesome. Like, that was a perfect introduction to that. Sonic calling him Eggman is the perfect way to, to bring that into the into the story, which Speaking I thought was awesome. Speaking of Eggman, <laughs> I hope that they make him rounder, rounder. in the yeah. sequel. I mean, he's got a lot of big mushrooms to eat. He's he's probably going to pack a few pounds. I was going to say that mushroom diet, just, I hope that, like, gets him. Can we, like, take a moment to acknowledge the fact that Sonic outwardly stated that he doesn't like mushrooms, and... 
Mario loves mushrooms. I actually hadn't that didn't click until right. It now. is a very like subtle knock at Mario, which I thought was great. Yeah, down with mushrooms, up with chili dogs. <laughs> Even the chili dog thing, like, they just, like, threw it in there, nice and cute. <laughs> they never, like, take a reference and, like, shove it down your throat, you know what I mean? Like, it's always just perfectly placed, not too much time spent on it, but, you know, hey, it's there. Like Sanic? Like, yeah, Sanic was in the movie, and it was exactly the way I thought it was going to be done. The way they did it was just, like, so perfect. Because it was, it was uh, the crazy guy's rendition of what he looked like. <laughs> oh, man. Um, let's talk about Sonic's backstory, because this seems to be, like, one of the few things that people are like, I don't know about that. Uh, because we see him as a baby on Green, Green Hill. Um, Green Hill looked fantastic. Like, perfect ad 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 adaptation. I'd run, ad. I'd run through there. Yeah, who wouldn't? Uh, I think it's, like, the owl mom that people are like, what's up with that? <laughs> what's this? But I thought it was nice to give Sonic kind of a parental figure, because we don't know who his parents are. Mm -hmm. So they had to fill in the gap. Well, there's a lot there that I feel like they didn't get into, but I feel like the explanations are coming if there's a sequel. Yeah. I mean, he, he gets chased out of Green Hill and uses his rings, um, which is canonically what they do, by the way, for all the people who are saying they don't. They, they are literally transportation devices. They've always been that. <laughs> Okay. Okay, I didn't know that, so I'm learning. Well, that's how Sonic gets to the bonus stage in the classics. I was thinking about that after you mentioned that. Yeah. Also, in the Sonic Mania intro, the rings in the intro literally go from zone to zone, so they probably pulled it directly from that. So it wasn't, like, completely left field. Well, I think with the elements like that, that is a fair interpretation of it. Some, like, certain yeah. things, like, you have to kind of... Like how Give do you, an explanation to. Why in the world would Sonic just have rings? Like, if they didn't do something, right? They give him power. I mean, you and can they were also his say that... <laughs> he can always have one ring to stay alive. Um, one ring to Where escape. was I going to go? We're talking about Owl Mom, right? Yeah. Yes, so he's getting chased by very <laughs> Sonic-looking creatures. Which we uh, most people are assuming are echidnas, because the echidnas are the guardians of the chaos emeralds, and the, you know they didn't like dive into that stuff, but that definitely seems like that's for the third movie with Knuckles, Sonic Three and Knuckles. It seems like where they're going with the sequel is definitely going to be like a Sonic Two plus Sonic Three and Knuckles. They're just gonna like go head first into that stuff. No, 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 no. I will not accept Knuckles uh, before the third movie. He's only going to be in the third movie. Yeah, and even well, then, he can't wait, be wait, in, wait, 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 can't wait, wait. even be in the third movie. He has to be like DLC for the third movie. But <laughs> if you put the Sonic Two cartridge in the Sonic and Knuckles cartridge, and then put it in the Genesis, you get Knuckles and Sonic Two. You're right. It's canon. You're right. You're right. <laughs> You're right. Um. Yeah, Sonsi says it's the Kidna Race Two. So like. Uh, yeah, they're definitely setting up for some of that stuff. I'm glad that they didn't, like, dive too deep into Sonic lore right away. They're kind of, like, taking it slow, which is going to be great for audiences who are new to Sonic, uh, which I think is what the goal of this movie was. Like, appease the fans, but also make this accessible. And then with the sequel, let's get into the, the big, you know, lore stuff that fans love. Mm-hmm. I mean, and we know they're going that way because of that incredible extra post credit scene that we got after the movie, which showed us Tails, and he's so good. Yeah, and... Uh, he's voiced by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. <laughs> he's actually voiced by the person who voices Tails in the games right now. Oh, that's really solid. I yeah. was also going to point out something really interesting about Tails, is that Tails actually has multiple Tails. They have attention to detail. <laughs> I'm wondering, like, I'm so sad did that didn't Tails' land. original design, like, did he have like a design closer to Sonic that they like went in and changed? Yeah, because... I've been wondering about that. Or was like, or did they not even put Tails in until after all this ridiculous controversy? Well, I mean, I guess from like a marketing standpoint, like, okay. Obviously, Sonic has a pretty rich history. There's a lot of, like, story beats you could draw from, like, literally any of those games. 
Um, and when you're trying to make a Sonic the Hedgehog film, like obviously all you really need is Sonic. Yeah. Um, obviously we had Eggman as well. Uh, but you know, this is just like, okay, now we can make a second film, a third film, a fourth film, whatever it may be, uh, in the Sega universe. Who knows? Maybe they'll cross over to some other. <laughs> and while we things. joked about it earlier, like, you know, the first Sonic game was just Sonic the Hedgehog and they didn't introduce Tails until Sonic 2. So... You know, that just follows the way the games work out. I kind of like that better than just, like, trying to, like, shoehorn characters in. Yeah. Like, wait till they're... Which is something the, the Sonic games place. are bad about. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, introduce these characters. I, I feel like Sonic the Hedgehog 2 will give us Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and then, like, a fully realized Eggman. And then maybe tease another character at the end, like Amy Rose or something. Animals or Shadow the Hedgehog. I really want to see like on the big screen like the dynamic between Sonic and Amy, and just like how like, like she chases him, yeah, yep, and he's like, okay, gotta go fast, and just runs away. So my wife had a theory that I thought made a lot of sense after the movie ended because Eggman still has one of Sonic's quills, which is infused with his power, which we don't fully understand. Like he has this power to speed up and. He gets really sparky and electricity-like. Um, but she says he's going to use that information and that quill that he has to make Metal Sonic. And I'm like, that's a perfectly reasonable way for this to go. That would be a really fun direction for him. And Metal Sonic's one of the most popular villains in the whole series. He's like Sonic, but he's metal. Wow! And he's not, he's not good. He's actually a bad guy for those of you who couldn't parse it out. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, uh, the biggest thing that this movie did for me was make me excited for the next one. <laughs> it just, it was a fun time. Yeah. I went in, I laughed, I enjoyed myself, I left. Man, the cycle of, hey guys, we got a Sonic movie on the way, to, hey guys, here's the first footage of the said Sonic movie, and being Gangster's like, oh Paradise. god. Uh, and then to, they're like, wait a minute, we lied. Actually, here's what you're going to be looking at. And everybody's like, wait a minute, this looks like a lot better than the last thing. And then you're like, oh, actually, maybe I might be excited about this film. Who knows? And then you get into it and you're like, oh, well, actually, that was a pretty good film. I wonder what the sequel's going to be like. When was the last time we felt that about a video game film? In that exact order of events? Never. Well, yeah, how often have I mean, you seen a movie where, like, like, the first impression was that terrible, and then they turn it around, and by the time you actually go to the theaters to see it, you love it? Well, I think this is a unique phenomenon yeah. for me in particular with the fact that, like, okay, with Detective Pikachu, it was a good film. It was a fun film. Uh, but I didn't feel the kind of excitement that I felt with Sonic the Hedgehog. Maybe because I have, like, a history with Sonic that I don't have with Pokemon. I'm kind of coming from a similar place, and I don't know exactly what it is, because I feel like from a technical standpoint, Detective Pikachu is a better movie. Mm. But Sonic the Hedgehog succeeds in pe appeasing the fans more in that movie, I think, than the Pokemon movie does. And that's because, like, the Sonic movie is very much a Sonic movie. The Pokemon movie is a spinoff of a Pokemon movie. Right. That's what I was getting ready to say. Yeah. Is that, like, if you take what Pokemon is, they captured this little bit of it versus, mm -hmm. like, the main... I mean, they gave us hints, like, that, you know, that grander world is there. Like, they referenced that Mewtwo, you know, came from the Kanto region 20 years ago, which is, like, a very, like, on-point reference to the movies. Mm -hmm. Um... But, like, Sonic was just, like, we're in the Sonic world. This is Sonic doing his thing. Um, it's not like we had Ash and Pikachu, right? I mean, if you, uh, if you take Detective Pikachu and you compare it to the Detective Pikachu game, how well did they adapt that? It's, it's a very, very faithful adaptation to the game. I would say that Sonic did the same thing, but... For the main series? Yeah, versus yeah. just a spinoff, which is why it's, like... More exciting. But in both cases, it's amazing how well they did adapting, the, you know, video game to film because it's something that clearly is not as easy as we all think it is or expect it to be. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, at this point, like the some of these IPs that we're working with are twenty plus years old. Yeah. Uh, and so hopefully by this point, you'd have some actors uh, and some directors and people who like grew up. 
uh, around these things or at least have had time to like digest, uh, you know, some of these things to hopefully make better films, which as far as I'm concerned, uh, we've gotten two of the best video game films here uh, in the last like what, two years. Yeah. And, um, and I think that spells, I, I think it's less of like, oh, the video game purse is broken and more of like, like, we're starting to understand what makes a video game movie a good movie, right? Yeah, because we understand video games more. I mean, when did video games come out? Like, you know, we've only been in full swing with video games since, like, the 70s, you know? Well, I'm sure a lot <laughs> so, of, like, the earlier attempts, too, were just like, oh, hey, people are really into this. We'll make money if we make this movie. Yeah, like, the intention and the motivation behind it wasn't like, hey, let's make a great film. It's like, hey, let's cash in on a trend. And to clarify what I meant um, when I said that Detective Pikachu is faithful, like... From a plot perspective, no. The plot of the video game isn't complete. The, the movie had to kind of fill in that for, for people. But when I, say it, when I say that it's faithful, I mean that it's faithful in both the world building, um, the representation of the characters, and just like being faithful to the Pokemon universe. Um, but it's not like a beat-for-beat -beat retelling of the plot, which is exactly the same situation as Sonic. You can't really expect them with film to do a beat-for-beat -beat representation, unless it's like... yeah an hour and a half long game right and the, i mean the plot would have to be like super forward in order for you to even have to do that i, I think one way to put it into perspective is like the dragon quest movie that i think we were also going to talk about at some point today yes um they jump around a lot because they do try and like capture this you know what 40 plus hour game. hundred hour i don't know exactly very very long rpg <laughs> and you have to condense all the story beats and information like condense it down and they they did a good job for how much they were trying to like cram in there but it was kind of like a breakneck pace from yes. beginning to end i'm just like imagining a sonic movie where there's like long stints of like okay three or four minute like scene where it's just sonic platforming like getting from like point A to point B. Oh, next story beat, but oh, in between here's some loops and here's some platforms. <laughs> oh, here's some like bumpers and some. There was yeah. a pretty like impressive level, uh, reference that wasn't Green Hill that you mentioned to me that I didn't even pick up on. Um, when they're running through San Francisco, which is what City Escape is based yep. on, but there was the scene where he throws the ring down at the bottom of the hill and he's running through it i think they go into egypt after that one mm -hmm. or the great wall of china um but you see him running towards the camera at a downhill slope that's him being chased by the truck at the end of the level and that blew my mind when you said that i was like that's <laughs> incredible yeah again like you said it before that like this is very faithful to the sonic universe and the way that they kind of like throw in references to each game or to uh, personality traits of Sonic or other characters in the world. Yeah. You can tell that the people who were writing and directing this, the web of knowledge seems relatively complete. They did a lot of research, yeah. for sure. Um, and they had fun with it. Yeah, which is what we want. And remember, kids, have fun with it. <laughs> uh, so I guess before we move on from Sonic... I'll get a, just a quick statement from each of you. What was your favorite part of the movie? Uh, that is a good question. I think my favorite part of the movie is like when Sonic goes really fast and the way that they play with that, right? Yeah. Uh, like they showed it in the trailers on several occasions when Sonic's like, oh, look, all these missiles are coming towards me. I'm going to check my watch. And it's just like, oh, we're going to play with the fact that, yeah, Sonic's really fast, okay? Um, and that whole, like, chase scene at the very beginning of the movie that they're, like, come back around to at the end of the movie. Yeah. You know, just, like, classic Eggman's chasing down Sonic. Um, I think the only thing about that that they could be clear on is, like, why Eggman is, like, so, like, he doesn't like Sonic at it, all. I think they did establish that fairly well, and that's that Eggman is a man who wants to understand everything, and Sonic is something that is completely foreign to him. Mm -hmm. So if he doesn't capture and dissect Sonic, and dissecting animals is something he said he really liked to do, uh, he can't 
understand what Sonic is. And it's only going to be worse for him once all the echidnas and tails and everybody else shows up. Aliens. The Chaos Emeralds. <laughs> so yeah, I like when Sonic goes fast, and uh, those are my favorite parts of the film. This is a tough one. I, I, I really like that part at the beginning of the movie before he's kind of revealed himself, mm-hmm. where it's just like his antics in this town where oh, nobody yeah. really knows he's existing. Donut Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I love the personalities he gave to the people, mm-hmm. especially Donut Lord. And Pretzel Lady. Pretzel <laughs> Lady. Um, in addition to that, um, that first, like, chase with uh, Robotnik, where he keeps sending the, like, robot after them, and they keep breaking it, but, like, it keeps breaking down to little and little pieces. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, finally, like, that last little, like, eyeball-sized drone is going after them, and I'm actually, like, in my chair just like, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it keeps going. But by the time, like, the, they finally get to San Francisco in the shape of the truck, mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that got me pretty, pretty good. <laughs> also, the sister. Oh, yeah. And she's, like, not on board with, uh, with her husband. Oh, uh, yeah. And then the, her, like, daughter just, like, gets really into Sonic once he shows up. Mm-hmm. And she's just running around at the end. Can I go fast? Can I go fast? Can I go <laughs> fast? <laughs> she also is the character who gives him his trademark shoes. Which is interesting, because like throughout all the trailers, Sonic always had his shoes. But that's not the case in the movie. That's a an interesting detail to have kept quiet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, she, he gets his shoes from a human, which I, I think is kind of neat. The difference is he can go faster now, because it's actually a power-up. <laughs> He's got the light speed shoes. Um, I think for me, my favorite part of the movie is probably also that end chase sequence. Specifically the moment where Sonic pushes... Uh, Tom and his wife off the edge of the building and he's like and that's his plan because like I can go fast I'll just go catch him but then Eggman reveals that he can use the power of that quill he stole to also enter that kind of speed zone that Sonic can go into and uh, I thought that was a really cool way of making Eggman a threat Mm -hmm. because like uh, before that point Sonic was basically invincible because he could essentially freeze time because he went so fast. Right. But uh, now he's got this person who can keep up with him, and that's a really cool way to build your villain. It was a nice like adaptation to all his like vehicles too. Yeah. Because why would they be a threat if he could move that fast? Mm-hmm. And it's cool in the credit sequence they make a reference to that too. Like he's in the vehicle he's in in the movie, but it's got the ball and chain from the first level of Green Hill Zone. Uh. So yeah, great stuff. Also, also, we have to like talk about how great the theme song for that movie was. Uh, what is it called? Speed Me Up. Yep. That song is really good. <laughs> I, I keep listening to it just like on loop. I was cleaning my kitchen the other day, just listening to it on loop. I'm just like, I run. It's funny because I remember when they released the list of artists who were going to be in the movie, and Logan and I were just laughing at the list because like little yachty's on it. And then the song came out, and I was like, actually, this is kind of a yeah, bop. it's kind of bopping. Yeah, <laughs> I am kind of upset that they didn't like use more of those like Sonic jams. They they held those close to their chest. Like there's that one time right at the end of the movie where we get that kind of like almost diner style Green Hill Zone theme. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like that. I feel like they're going to probably go a little deeper into that in the next one. Hit us with those jams. <laughs> um, so quickly, the next movie we watched, and Logan actually hasn't seen this one yet. Oh no. So there's some things we can't talk about, but things are really, we really should. Um, the Dragon Quest movie. I, I knew that like the ending was supposed to be like controversial that there were like th- people were kind of divided on it. So yeah. I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, but I really enjoyed it. It is for one, it's beautiful. Oh, it is absolutely gorgeous. Just like Dragon Quest Eleven, the first time I saw that, I thought, man, that game is gorgeous. Man, this movie is gorgeous. It I, the slime, the slime the is texture so for the good. Slime, I just want to touch him. You can see the little <laughs> jelly bubbles inside him. You can see through him, and he's just like so clear. Yeah, that movie. Shiny. So for those who don't know, it's an adaptation of Dragon Quest V, specifically. Um, and I didn't know the story of Dragon Quest V. I didn't either. <laughs> and there were some twists that are actually in the game that I thought were really good. <laughs> I was like, wow, this would have blown my mind as a kid. Um, but yeah, it's a very pretty movie. It's uh, Like you said, it does skip around a bit. Like the, That first act of the game seems to be 
kind of lost in translation there. Mm-hmm. Like the character of Bianca, like she and and Luca have a history together. It actually really threw me off when they showed her in three D because like the, they introduce the story in like the two D sprites. Yeah, and so there's a lot of things that are just like in game format. And so when she shows up, it's like, who is she? And then they mention her name. It's like, oh, I remember seeing that in the 2D part. Yeah. And there was like a, there's a very good reason for that that I don't really want to like spoil. But it was such like a creative way to like circumvent a problem. Yeah. In the, like visual telling of it. They, they, for what they had to work with, they did a great job like telling the story, getting us all the important bits, getting us attached to the characters. Even even then, like some of the party members, like uh, their cat, like Percy. Percy, yeah. You don't have a lot of. I feel like I didn't have a lot of attachment to the character because that was part of the two D segment, like when they first rescue him and he becomes a friend. So I mean, it was still like when he uh, when he runs into him later on after like yeah. being away for ten years, and he just like he's running away from this what is it saber tooth cat? It was something. Some he's running away from monster. Percy because he doesn't know it's Percy. And then, like, they look over, and he's just running next to them, not attacking them. And he's like, wait, Percy? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny, like, watching this movie after having played Dragon Quest XI, like, the way the plot works out is very just, this seems to be, like, how Dragon Quest works. Because I was like, oh, that's <laughs> that part in Dragon Quest XI? That's that part in Dragon Quest XI? <laughs> um... Even down to, like, the nasty villain design that you mentioned. In case y'all aren't following us on Twitter, I really <laughs> hate the villain's design. He is so disgusting. He's really And nasty. I really, like, he has this really gross, very long chin, and the entire, like, final sequence, I just wanted them to, like, go to cut his head off and get that chin with it. <laughs> okay, so you're saying that, like, you hate it, but because it's such a good design. Because I hate it so much, and it's a villain, it's perfect. Okay. Yeah, it, it achieves what it's set out to do. Um, and his eyes. I didn't even get to his eyes. His They're eyes, like, like, bulge and point two different ways, yeah. <laughs> um, but you watched the dub. I watched the sub. What did you think of the dub? Well, they had Yuri Lowenthal as the hero, so... Oh, well, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, almost I recognize that. Like, it, the mouth flap is off. I grew up on the era where you were watching uh, fan Naruto episode 20 whatever, part one of three, and the fan sub, which would be like the dialogue like 30 seconds ahead, but, they, you know, the person was trying their best. And there also there was <laughs> cuss words in there for some reason. That weren't there, the, yeah. <laughs> so, like, I can, I can edgy. handle it. I know my fiance was a little like, oh. I tried, like, putting on the subtitles for her, but, like, they don't match up with what the actual dialogue right, okay. is, which So it's her. the Japanese sub to the English... Oh, gosh. It's, so I'm guessing the film's animated. It's 3D animated. Oh, okay. So the mouth flaps are very, very Japanese. Also, okay. that Toriyama art style is really, like... It, it took a while, but they're, like, adapting it into 3D really well these days. They kind of abandoned it mostly for a lot of the human characters, but the Toriyama style, especially for the monsters, is very, very present. Um, and I, th yeah, I agree. I think it looked great. One of the criticisms of the movie, especially in Japan, was the Toriyama style just kind of being... taking a back seat, at least in the human characters, but I don't know. I think they found the right blend. Mm-hmm. Because everyone, it just looks so good. <laughs> the fight scenes are awesome. I love that opening like part when he really he finally ventures forth. That's what you say in Dragon Quest. Um, and they they have like a little intro that would like play in the game, and it's got the the the, uh, the Dragon Quest main theme playing in the background. I was mm. like, this is perfect. I'm getting all excited. Um, for one, that song is amazing. I love listening to it, but it just gets me in the mood to go on an adventure. <laughs> And like, they cram like we already discussed how like crammed a lot of story beats into that, and it expands over a long, large period of time. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, it does. I kind of appreciated that. It actually like they managed to like make me love all of the characters in such a short amount of time. And like, I cried several times throughout watching this movie. It's very touching. Um, and we've made reference to the ending. 
you will you you'll never expect what happens. <laughs> Just be prepared. I, I don't think you like you can't. I don't think it's possible to expect what happens. But I think it like the very last shot at the end of the credits. Stick yeah. around through the credits for this. Um, it's just like a simple like one frame thing, but without that like crazy twist, it wouldn't have worked as well, as right? Hard. Yeah. Like it it came on. I read it and just like insta tears. And you do not need to be like a Dragon Quest fan or have played the game. You really should watch the movie. I think this is more like a love letter, not to Dragon Quest fans specifically, but just gamers as a whole. Yeah, it definitely is. It um, comes down to your level and says, hey, we're gamers too. <laughs> Please, watch the movie. You will not... You don't know what you're in for. <laughs> yeah, if anything, it might get you into Dragon Quest, and then you have an experience like these goons over here where they just, you know, spend like a ridiculous amount of time Ugh, playing the latest one. I only put How six many hours? hours in so far, okay? I think I'm over 60 in my file. I, I've owned it since it came out. I just didn't have time to play it. He's Don't playing worry, it now. It'll happen. It'll happen. It's happening now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we'll move on from that, and I guess I won't hold it back from you guys any longer. Let's talk about Animal Crossing. Wait, what? Wait. There was what? a direct? There was an Animal Crossing direct. Did you know that? Wait. Wait, are you saying there's a new Animal Crossing game on its way? In fact, it comes out in less than one month. Uh, I mean, I gotta, like, reestablish again that I'm not a huge Animal Crossing person. I owned City Folk on the Wii, and it wasn't my favorite game. That's why he's not a huge fan. Exactly. <laughs> but I'm, I'm getting really excited. Like, all the shots of them just, like, looking at the scenery in the direct, and I'm like, mm -hmm. I want to just sit in that chair and look at this scenery of this game. That's it! That's Animal Crossing! You got it! I think the best thing about this hype cycle is that, like, like any good hype cycle, you don't understand going into it how hype it's gonna get. Yeah. Right. So here I am sitting earlier. I was listening to a discussion uh, via uh, Josh Thomas of the Bit Block and Roger Space discussing the direct. Hi, and they were obviously getting really into it and really excited and talking about all this other stuff and reiterating stuff I already knew. But as I just sat there, you know, everything's working in my brain and I'm like, wow, okay, terraforming's real. Like it's something that's coming. Uh, and all of these things that like, you know, may seem uh, relatively innocuous, like those are going to be the things that like tie this experience together and really give us something that we haven't had before in Animal Crossing. And it, it's starting to really settle in like just how many, how much time I'm going to spend in this game customizing and building and just... <laughs> everything i want to about this town telling villagers no you can't move there and plant over my trees and my flowers and my patterns uh you That's have how you get a to live built here. around your house and you can't get in <laughs> or out of it so brandon mentioned to me your plans for your town and i want i want i, have, a, I, I want a handful cuz i want i want to play a very like passive aggressive like playthrough where I'm just a, a jerk to all the villagers. I want to be as unwholesome as possible. And, uh... Okay. Um, <laughs> I want to be as wholesome as possible. And so, like, a couple ideas I've, I've come up with is I put all of the, um, the other townsfolk in one corner, and then I put my house in the other corner. So they're as far away from me as possible. That's beautiful. And then send them a bunch of like nasty notes. Um, I could also build a moat <laughs> around <laughs> their little section of the island. Um, so that, that might be something I do. Um, I've also thought like with the terraforming, I could put my house dead center. I can put water all around it, so it's its own little island. Yep, yep. Then I could put another little strip with you know the important things, you know like. Uh, the uh, like visitor center with the shop, um, all of like the sh other shops and uh, museums and whatnot in that next little strip. Then surround that with water, so it's another little island. And then all the other neighbors are on the outside. 
far, far away from me where I don't have to deal with them or look at them. <laughs> this is my town. I think for me, I think I'm just going to have to feel it out, right? I'm just going to have to dive in, start getting the thing. Because, like, you know, you're not going to be able to start thinking about, like, Terraform or, or some of these other things that you're going to get later on as you play. Like, you're going to have those first obstacles that are going to keep you from those things uh, until a later point. Uh, so I think I'll probably have to get a feel for my town and what I want to do. But I am excited about the fact that, like, oh, if I wanted to, like, I could, yeah, I could build an island, you know, and put mm. my house on the island. Yeah. And then, you know, have a moat around it, have something real dope, maybe put some, like, walls, like, surrounding it and make it, like really like exclusive i think that's what the, i one of the things i really want to do is just have like my house right at the center of the map and then just like build up and just make it incredible just it, have the best thing ever <laughs> it's been funny for me like with this uh hype cycle as an outsider just the things that like animal crossing fans get really excited about and then the terraforming hit and i'm like I started like thinking of all the possibilities and just how like customized I can make this island. And then I started getting excited. This is like the next logical step for Animal Crossing in terms of what you have control over. And it's not it, some people are are complaining that maybe it's a little too much or like it's making it too much like the Sims, but this is like a feature you have to work for. You don't unlock the ability to ter terraform land until you get the golden shovel. Um and water until you get the silver shovel. So it's it's not like you can do this right away. Like this is something that you're gonna keep playing and keep working towards. And I like that. It makes the game last longer. Um, because like you're gonna customize your town up until you get to that point, and then you're gonna recustomize your town. <laughs> well, I think like as a whole, they're really setting it up so you can make your island whatever you want to be. Yeah. I mean, just like starting with you can place your neighbor's tents for them. So if you don't want them nearby. Or like building their houses in the middle of something you were already working on. Which is a big complaint about New Leaf. But you can just like. You really like from the ground up make this town whatever it is you want it to be. Yeah. I, man, it just seems like they looked at New Leaf and what people were doing to kind of make things the way they wanted it to be and just built all of those things as features into the game like pavement so like, yeah like people would just download patterns for pavement and then put them down as you know the paths and stuff like that and now the paths and uh different other types of materials are available just to customize your town like you can even round them out which is awesome yeah you can yeah get around i mean that comes in with the terraforming too like yeah. oh here i'm gonna plant this but then i'm gonna like actually like kind of cut it diagonally to make it more natural you know i saw uh one of the towns during the direct that had a playground and the playground had a nice round uh dirt pavement that to separate it from the rest of the ground, and I was like, that playground That's like awesome. stood out to me too. Yeah, I don't know like what it is about, but I think it's just because you make the town wherever you want. If you want it to be accessible to children, you can build a playground. I they really like showed, especially in part two of that direct, like how unique your towns can look because you can place furniture outside, you can terraform, you can build your pavement however you want, and I can just see already like how vastly different every player's town's going to be. Also, something that has been underhyped that they've talked about since the beginning is the fact that you can like move pieces of furniture in half steps and how yeah. much cooler that's going to make like just setting everything together and I don't know. Like again, like it's the Animal Crossing thing where it's like you get excited about the littlest things, but like they're also like bringing back the movement and furniture placing features from Happy Home Designer. I was going to say, well, watching the direct when they're like rearranging the house, like, that looks kind of fun. I might be <laughs> into that. I was just thinking, so as I was listening to that discussion, uh, Josh Thomas was talking about how, or maybe he was while he was watching uh, maybe he's his not reaction. a fan of that part. Yeah, he's like, wah, wah, wah. and I'm like, bro, you can still like throw things down on the ground and like move uh, them by hand. Yeah, just do it the slow old way. And but, I like, can understand like wanting to stay pure with that kind of thing, but also not all of us have as much time. 
Well, I mean, for something like that, like, why would you want to spend extra time when you could do it really quickly? Like, I know how I want to lay it out, or maybe I want to lay it out one play way and be like, okay, now let's see if I can, like, improve it. So instead of, oh, picking this back up, picking this back up, it's going to be a lot easier to coordinate it, all it of was those little pieces. pretty obnoxious for me in New Leaf to, like, whenever I wanted to redecorate my house, I always just entered the room and I looked at everything I was going to have to deal with and then I just give up because yeah. like it just takes too long. Mm -hmm. But you can pick up a, a piece of furniture and put it directly in storage from inside your house. You don't have to walk over to the chest and put it in there manually. Um, they've really streamlined a lot of things. And that makes it easier if you have like themes for different like rooms or areas, yeah. then you can just kind of like very quickly shift things around to be, have just wherever you want to be. Um, one of the things about New Leaf that always frustrated me was inventory management. You had a limited number of inventory slots Gross. in your like your larger storage, and then of course you had a small amount of inventory that you could hold onto your person. You can expand that in New Horizons by uh, using Nook Miles. Yeah, I saw up to four this rows. This really is a New Horizon. Yeah. Yes, this is this is really cool because I remember the days of being like, I don't have enough stuff inventory space. So I'll just keep a bunch of old letters, that's, and then I'll drop the items in there. If that's I where have some uh, our friend Joe puts all of his in-game tools inside of his letters. <laughs> uh, did you guys see the magic wand? The magic wand? It's a new tool. It I allows it, you. But I forgot. It allows you to save preset outfits, and then. Use the magic wand to just change into them. So you have armor sets. Basically. <laughs> you just have to register them. Yeah, so you don't have to go into your box and manually put on each piece of clothes. You can just so you have can them ready. you go get coffee with an old friend and go to a funeral at 6. <laughs> yes. But I was talking to Joe. I was like, I have day clothes. I have sleepy time clothes. I have naked clothes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I love like all of the quality of life features. Like... In a game like Animal Crossing, that's the first place I'm going to be looking. Um, mm -hmm. And all the extra stuff we get on top of that is just supplementary to, the, to that. Because, you know, it's Animal Crossing. How much bigger do you get? <laughs> um, they've also confirmed 383 villagers will be in the game. Which is the same amount of villagers that are in New Leaf after the Welcome Amiibo update. So there are villagers that have been cut. Um, that said, I imagine they will come back in free updates over the course of the next couple of years. Yeah. That being said, they probably cut some of the really dumb looking ones that nobody wants in their towns. Like nobody's going to be like, they're going to open like a welcome, like, like an Amiibo card pack. Mm -hmm. Right. And be like, oh yeah, I totally wanted this card. Right. Nobody would go out of their way to buy that in, in, that that card in particular, so there those are the ones that were like, no, we're gonna get those out of the way. <laughs> oh yay, puck! I'm really curious as to what was cut though. I don't know. Um, do we have the full list done of of villagers? Be really nice. <laughs> Wait Don? like thirty seconds and just <laughs> because like... I want to figure out like what what animals were in New Leaf and they aren't. And then we can have like a requiem because uh, yeah, we clearly have new villagers don't. in this game. Um, have the list? Yeah, don't have a list. Okay. Um, so the, so some of the villagers must have been cut to make room for the new ones. Yeah, because um, there's some really interesting new ones, some very colorful ones. There's one that reminds me of like a is it is it Lisa Frank? The really like colorful art like rainbows and oh yeah, like yeah, that. yeah 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 uh there's like a villager that like gives me serious lisa frank vibes <laughs> and i love it wow rainbow art <laughs> um yeah this direct i think told me pretty much everything i wanted to know they're definitely keeping some things under wraps because Good. you know telling us stuff that spoils Animal Crossing. And that's always the concern is yeah. that they're going to reveal too much or too little. Because it's like if it, they reveal too little, then I'm not sure. Like, okay, what am I supposed to be buying this game for? If they reveal too much, then I'm like, wait a minute. What is there to they, they, discover? They did this the right way. They, they told us basically how progression works and what kinds of things we can expect to unlock over time. Yeah. Without explicitly telling us what those things are. I mean, they even ex didn't even... <sighs> I don't think they even mentioned like how the tools play into terraforming or did they like in terms of like we figured it out like obviously we know that um 
you have to achieve a certain level of tool to access like the terraforming you know to get those permits yeah but i don't think they said it explicitly in I, you go into your nook phone and you I forget the name of the app, but it puts you like in construction mode. Yeah, you get like a permit. And I think it auto applies whatever tool you use to mm -hmm. do the terraforming. Okay. So you're just like in terraforming mode. Right. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's just as quick as opening the Nook phone and pressing a button. Right. Uh, also, I guess this is something we should talk about. Uh, your phone, your real phone. The Switch Online It does app. things. It's useful and it's actually convenient. Specifically like with the QR codes, right? Because like with the 3DS, you, you can, can scan. You can pa patterns from old games. That's pretty cool. cool. Very cool. Also, one of the things I thought was pretty novel uh, is that you can use the in-game text chat by chatting through the Nook line or Nook Link app. This is going to make for a lot of great memes. Yeah, online. I can see it happening. You're just like, okay, two people. Like, you could just see, I could see like a four panel, like Animal Crossing New Horizons comic of just like <laughs> going back and forth, mm -hmm. you know, between two characters. Uh, I loved the little bubble text chats that you could do in New Leaf. Um, and I was going to miss that in this game. I see this being more fun with strangers. Mm -hmm. Just like chatting because well, i don't want to use my voice you have like a, an actual mm -hmm. way of like and, and, and a decent way of like sending messages like i can type nice on and my quick. phone yeah you know as opposed to be like oh bring up the keyboard and the switch do, and then and then five minutes later you got like a hello <laughs> uh i want to recreate that moment when i was playing new leaf with my wife and we were on tortimer's island with strangers and one of them was a, a Japanese child, and I was barely able to communicate with them with the limited Japanese I knew, and they rewarded me with one million bells from their bank account. Oh my god. <laughs> what a champ. Yeah, I was like, okay. <laughs> because you're doing, wow, incredible. Here's money. Donka. God, I would love a Donka. small loan of a million bells. Uh, you won't even need bells for some things because, like, with Nook uh, Miles paying for your home, yeah, you can do that with Nook Miles, which I think uh, is really great cool. Great proprietary currency. This is going to turn out great. It's free real estate. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's free real estate. Um, but I think it's safe to assume we're all pretty excited for Animal Crossing. Yep. Uh, what would you give that direct if you were to grade it? It's just like a an billionaire, if you will. A billionaire. <laughs> it's like a solid B for me. Yeah. I I'm gonna say a B plus because I like to one up you, and that's also how I feel. It's also Animal Crossing, which is your thing. So and also B lands in between A and C Animal Crossing. So I'm gonna probably give it a B myself. I was really hoping for some more information on multiplayer because I was really hoping multiplayer would be kind of expanded from past games, but it's really starting to look to me like it's just going to be the multiplayer from past games. <laughs> Except with some more robust like communication features, which yeah. is definitely improvement. I hope to see more emotes, right? And more just... Because, I mean, I, emotes I, in, like, a, in social games are some, tons of fun. Like, we were playing Final Fantasy XIV the other and day. And there's so many emotes. Yeah, well, I mean, we literally, we found each other in game and then just sat there and just emoted at each other for, like, a good ten minutes. So, like, you can emote at each other, but you can also change your expression independently of that. So, it's just, like, pressing all the buttons to get exactly what you want. <laughs> One thing that they started to like, touch on, and then they, they, never, they didn't answer my question with it, like, yeah, amiibos. You could tap in amiibos, villagers, and people. And I was just there, sitting there thinking, like, well, what if I tap in, you know, a non Animal Crossing amiibo? So Do I, I get something? It seems like the amiibo works pretty much the same way it did in New Leaf, where if you scan that villager in, you will have the opportunity to meet with them in your town and possibly convince them to move into your town. Um,. With extra like amiibo, like Zelda amiibo and stuff like that, some of them gave you Nintendo specific villagers. Like Wolf Link could move into your town, Ganon could move into your town, Epona could move into your town. I would just love to like tap in my Captain Falcon amiibo and get some F Zero like merch. I could imagine a little squirrel with a Captain Falcon helmet moves into your town. And I mean, they've played with that. Like, there's there's even Splatoon villagers that are just like the already existing octopus villagers mm -hmm. that just look very Splatoon like. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably what will happen. Maybe not for every amiibo, but some of them for sure. I want a loft wing. I want a loft wing villager now. Bring back 
the Palico slash feline villager from New Leaf, please. And also Rathalos. <laughs> <laughs> Rathalos the villager would be legit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so those were our main topics for this week. Uh, why don't we look at some of the smaller ones we, we can spend just a little few minutes on. Uh, well, I mean, recently, uh, this is something that... You, have you played through Cinder Shadows? I am over halfway through Cinder Shadows. Talk about that. So, Fire Emblem Three Houses DLC, Cinder Shadows. Paul, you've got a look on your face. I haven't started this DLC yet. I still need to, but tell me more, please. <laughs> so, uh, I'm in a precarious position because I have to play through Fire Emblem Three Houses Cinder Shadows as fast as I can because I'm editing Roger's Base's playthrough of Fire Emblem Three Houses Cinder Shadows. So, if I don't want to spoil myself, I kind of have to keep moving. Um, luckily, I've outpaced him a little bit. <laughs> so, that's working out for me. But. So, Fire Emblem Three Houses, the Cinder Shadows DLC, is a separate save file from the main game. Uh, if you go down to, in the menu, you'll select Side Story, and you'll have three save files for the Side Stories DLC. Um, which takes you to a place called the Abyss, which is underneath Garrett Mock Monastery, Makes where sense. a fourth house exists that apparently nobody knew about except people who weren't telling you that they knew about it. Um, you meet four new characters, the house leader, Yuri, uh, Constance, I almost called her Coco because that's her nickname. Uh, Happy and please tell me he's unhappy. Happy, she doesn't look very happy now that you mention it. Perfect. <laughs> and then there's Balthus, who is big, burly, beautiful, and I love him. So he's like Raph, but he is if Raph. He was forgotten. He's even the same unit, the same class. Uh, but the thing about this is a lot of the customization that you find in the main game is not here. You don't teach your students. You can't change their classes. You get what you get. This is a very traditional Fire Emblem experience. It's seven chapters long, and it's hard. Okay. They're not holding back. I tried this on hard, and I regretted it. <laughs> I could probably handle the main game on hard, but this is definitely a step above that. Mm -hmm. you, I didn't even have access to maddening for it. <laughs> I can't even imagine what that's like. Um but yeah, so you basically go to Abyss, you can talk to people. There's not a lot of a, you know, a lot of reasons to do that cuz there's not really any collecting or, you know, raising supports. There's no supports either. Um as far as I know. So it's like very much get in the battle, get out of the battle, get in the battle. I'm kind of with like two three more playthroughs to do for Fire Emblem. I'm kind of okay with that. It's a very quick DLC. Um it probably run you about eight to ten hours, is what I've heard, because I'm not done yet. But uh, after you beat this, and even like during it, you can start accessing the abyss and some of the units from the Ashen Wolves house in the main game. Okay. Um, in which, in, in that point, you can see their post time skip looks. Uh, you can get their supports and that kind of stuff, which is pretty neat. Also, I failed to mention you have access to all three main house leaders on your team during the whole DLC. Sadly, I don't think they have supports because I haven't managed to get any supports, and I was really excited about that. <laughs> but overall, I think this DLC is pretty good. Um, they also limit you in some other ways. There's a finite amount of money and a finite amount of ore. Oh. So you are limited on your weapons. Very, very limited on your weapons. <laughs> uh, also, don't let your units die because you ain't getting no more. Sounds like part <laughs> survival. It is, this is like Fire Emblem hard mode. <laughs> this is classic Fire Emblem. So for all of those people who were complaining about the main game not being very hard, and then they go. were like, they added maddening, and then they were like, actually, here's an even harder campaign that you can play. Also, yeah, it's like a lot harder. <laughs> it's it's rough goings. Strategery. Uh, Santi says he's seen support combos for Yuri. But those may have been in the main campaign because you can, like I said, you can recruit them. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, I'm really enjoying this. It is a unique story that takes place in the greater narrative. So, like, it does expand the history of Garrig Mach, uh, and you know, in addition to what we have already. Okay. So, like, there's value here if you really liked what was going on in the story. You can even marry them. Wow. 
I'm going to marry Balthus. Because I love him. <laughs> you would. You ha Have you seen Balthus? Look up a picture of Balthus and tell me he is not a hunk of man. Hunk of man. Have you seen Balthus? You've seen Balthus. Yeah, I've seen Balthus. He's a hunk of man. Hunk of man. Balthus. Balthus, hunk of man. Images. Definition, look it up. You're right. <laughs> I saw this one with the coat open and okay yeah oh yeah mm. yeah that's balthus that's the man i'm hungry like they go the overboard <laughs> the on action the wolf. hotness uh uh and they were like the character designer is like just a dash of cute a sexy <laughs> Some of the uh, some of the classes or the characters you get in Ashen Wolves have unique classes that aren't in the game yet. Okay. I don't know a lot about that yet because I don't think I'm far enough in. But Happy has the ability to sigh. <laughs> like that's a, an attack. When she sighs, it summons monsters. <laughs> <laughs> so Happy's really sad. It's just being ironic. Yeah, it, it's pretty. It's pretty funny. <laughs> um, I love that. I love Roger too, because like I edited his first four hour stream and he got really obsessed with Coco or Constance. So like he opens the video with a parody of, I, of I'm in love with the Coco. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he, the waifu game is strong. As it should be. Yes. Also, they got my waifu, Hilda, is one of the characters you get to use. How many waifus? I'm just waiting for like. Well, I'm not going to get it now, but I was hoping that one of the DLC things would add in like shipping. For other units oh like in the main game yeah. yeah maybe we'll get that in the next one because as of now like if i want to marry anybody i have to play the game all over again <laughs> and there's so many people i want to marry see i'm i'd be cool if they brought the the kind of the the shipping back from like awakening and fates did fates have shipping i actually don't know i think it did they used the same like time travel oh, okay thing, so that it was kind of like Kind of a turn off for some people because it didn't make sense in the context. It makes sense for Awakening because, like, time travel is kind of the thing. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I'd be okay if they brought back the the marriage system without the children. That's all I want. And give give the units who marry, like, some other kind of additional buff. If they gave them, like, just a super, like, kind of like in Pokemon when, like, you max out your friendship with your Pokemon. They start, like, surviving attacks. And, oh, like, it's yeah, very, yeah. It's very apparent that like you max out your friendship with I want it to be like that yeah that'd be cool because it felt very subtle in three houses like I didn't really notice it that often mm -hmm. but if they made it like super apparent and like I think the only thing it was really doing was increasing your your hit accuracy right I think so and like occasionally would up your avoidance but I think it was mostly just hit accuracy I remember in Awakening it was like it always felt like they were like guarding attacks for you or like or adding doing a another second. yeah it and was that so much made cooler. it really worthwhile to get all your support up i've i'd spend hours just doing like those side missions mm -hmm. and like pairing up two units together to like like max out the support and i do that for like everybody so i just had this web of like my main fighters that were so connected that it wasn't fair to the opponents yeah yeah some of that's lost in three houses but i think three houses overall makes a lot of great refinements to the battle system that i prefer mm -hmm. over the older games i think like the subtle elimination of the weapon triangle was kind of nice uh it still it still exists in some respects but it's right. like not as heavy as it used to I'm be i'm also really into just like letting or making whatever character you want into whatever class you want. Yeah, it's very open ended that way. It's really nice for Byleth being able. Like, I end up just like hitting the brawling really hard towards the end of it. Oh yeah, because you can make Byleth anything you want, and it's so cool. Like me and Josiah, we both did the Golden Deer route, and by the end, like our two teams, despite having all the same characters, were very different. And I love that. Um, Yes, it did. I don't know what that's in reference to, Don, but I love you anyway. <laughs> oh, I think it was, um, does uh, Fates have, like, the... The marriage system. Yeah. Okay. It's Moose Man. Yo, Nintendo is here. What's up? Also, I love the little TV setup, boys. Thank you. That's a new addition to the set. I thought it was nice. I figured if we're going to have a TV that's only, like, 13 up. inches. Hmm. <laughs> Balthus, man. I, I mean, I've played a little GameCube on here, because, I mean, that's... It's a great little TV. This is a Sony Trinitron, which is a a big want in the retro gaming scene and my dad just had a little one sitting in storage somewhere and he's like do you want this and i said yeah i really play good. melee <laughs> i, I play good. melee do you play melee bro <laughs> um 
Any other small stories before we get to the question slot? Uh, yeah. Do we have we, questions anyway? Uh, we got a we got a few. Okay. So good. here's what I'll mention. Uh, if you didn't know this already. Uh, Nintendo actually has a subscription service for NES and SNES games. No Go way. figure. Uh, kind <laughs> it's of easy a, to forget about that, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of a, you know, it's a, a dream, really. Uh, still limited, but uh, ever-expanding, right? And so we got four new games, two NES and two SNES games. Uh, on the NES games, Shadow of the Ninja and Eliminator Boat Duel. Uh, and these are things that I am not familiar with, so I don't really have a lot to say. I feel on. like that's gonna be most of the games coming to these surfaces. Yeah, the, the only game out of this list I've ever even heard of was Twin B. Yeah, so the SNES games are Poppin' Twin B and Smash Tennis. And the notable thing about these two is that neither of these are Goof Troop. I love Goof Troop on SNES. Sorry. I didn't know that was on SNES, but now I'm upset that it's not. Good it's a us. great little top-down co-op game. It's really fun. Yeah, it's, it's a lot super of fun. good. Like you know, I think we are probably in agreement when I say that the SNES selection is just like so far ahead of, of the, the NES. NES selection, um, and the fact that we don't have a ton of classics on the SNES Super Mario yet. RPG, Earthbound, Chrono Trigger, Donkey Kong Country. There's a lot of stuff missing. Yeah. So the fact that these... Oh, man. If we could get all the Donkey Kong Country games on the SNES service, like I would lose my mind. I'd love to play through 1 and 2. I'm not going to play through 3 just out of respect for John and Kitty Kong. I, love John. <laughs> I still need to play 2 and 3. Um, but yeah, so it's expanding. Uh, these Slowly games came out on Very Wednesday. So these are available for you to play if you want to get into Pop and Twin B. Uh, that is up to you. And hopefully we get some, I want to see some really significant drops uh, uh, here in the near future. Nintendon says Eliminator Boat Duel is super underrated. Still feels great to play. He went back to the service and it feels lovely. Hmm. I will have to give it a play then. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I guess we should be a little bit more fair. Like sometimes giving us games we've never heard of is the best thing. is the best thing yeah yeah especially like if they the are NES baseball yeah <laughs> if they are notable releases that just didn't get as much notoriety or didn't have the staying power that you know say something like mario mario 2 mario 3 had right uh, especially on the nes like it is good to like have this old stuff to to experience right even if it is too hard like man there are plenty of accessibility features on the services you can rewind <laughs> you can rewind you can have a bunch of save states you know so like there's plenty of ways of like cheating uh, just rewind your nes bro <laughs> bro um so yeah i'm glad those I'm are definitely here good at retro games and would never use those features because i'm so good <laughs> so, so if Nintendo could work something out with like Disney, uh, I don't even know if they'd have to touch on Capcom to get Goof Troop. Uh, but if they could just work something out and get Goof Troop on the service, I think that would be a big win. Yeah, I don't think it's entirely out of the realm. Disney also seems like they're open to getting their games, past and future, just out there. Uh, let's hope so, because there's been a discussion about Sora in Smash Bros. for a long time. I mean, Don't Square Enix is also a, probably an issue in that, but I would put know. it more on the side of Disney, but we'll see. I guess we don't really know. No, uh, we really don't. Yeah. Oh, well. So the last thing we could talk about before we get to the question slot um, is E3 and the future of E3. Now, the ESA has announced that Nintendo is committed to e3 nintendo um, also told us they'd be at e3 quite some time ago yes so e3 isn't quite dead yet and who knows maybe there is some time for them to uh reform the expo and bring it into a new age uh where people seem like they're losing interest in the show such as jeff Keighley, who announced that he will not be participating in e3 this year and he ran the E3 Coliseum series of panels all by himself. So that's kind of a big blow, if you ask me. Especially, yeah. I mean, it's Jeff Keighley. Like, he yeah. is a leading force in the game industry. 
Um, he's always about like developers, developers, developers. Let's talk to them. Let's let's celebrate games as art. And for him to not be at E3, that's a big blow, if you ask me. Yeah, big mm. big player in the games industry. I mean, uh, was E3 is just sleeping? Says Don <laughs> is headed up like what is now the most prestigious uh, video game awards show that there is. Uh, it's been some time, and you know now that the industry has matured like movies or music uh we now have a an award show that's you know really got the pomp and circumstance it's also viewed more than all the other ones just yeah gonna throw that out there so pretty pretty cool uh but going back really quick uh to just e3 like maybe i'll ask this question um how long do we see e3 still being relevant for three. Uh, three more. Three more three E three. Three. Um and uh if if that is an indefinite answer, you know, what I guess really the question would be like, do you think that uh E three and the people involved in that production have the capacity to maintain relevance? Well, I can't speak on that myself, and I mean none of us can. It's all speculation. Mm-hmm. But uh Last week's episode of Nintendo Voice Chat over on IGN, Per Schneider seemed to be in the know on some things about E3 this coming, uh, this coming E3, and he seems to believe that this show will be doing some pretty neat stuff. I don't want to quote him exactly because I can't remember exactly what he said, but I'm sure if you thumb through that episode, you'll find what he mentioned, but... I don't know. He seemed strangely confident. Okay. Well, I mean, that makes me excited. I mean, I I still look forward to E3, right? Yeah. At this point, like, E3 is still uh, a major player in, like, new information, new games, showing off new, inf- like, They're going to give whatever. Bang an even bigger booth. <laughs> so. Bang was such a weird booth, man. <laughs> Great got, drink. Weird booth. They oddly got be wasting all my money at work on them so also we went back to that booth like three times and we got free drinks two of them yeah we did and the other times we just watched the awkward dancing that was happening on stage so so yeah um uh i want to kind of mention what don said really quick he said keely is going for that gamescom money it's six times bigger than e3 he did have uh i forget what the name of the presentation was but it i think it was uh Something tonight live at Gamescom. Mm -hmm. Uh, Don, you probably know it better than I, but it was a great presentation. Um, Game announcements. We had Hideo Kojima there showing off. I think it was the first time we had actual gameplay of uh, Death Stranding. Stranding, Yes. Um, So I feel like that will be a bigger presence year over year. And of course, like Don already said, Gamescom is a bigger event than E3 in the first place. So I think it will make sense to start pulling those announcements that direction. And, of course, over the last few years, we've had Nintendo doing their, well, actually, I think almost 10 years now. They've been doing directs. They've been doing directs a long time. Um, God, how long I know, like, that blew my mind when I was thinking about it. I was like, wait a minute. I remember watching the first direct. It wasn't live-streamed. It was 10 minutes long, and it was Reggie sitting in front of the camera, and he just kind of, it was casual. And I was like, this is weird. I'll never watch this again. That was in high school, right? I think so. I mean, been out of high school a long time now. We're getting old. Man. Yeah, I mean, me and Brandon have talked about how long we've known each other. 2011? Yeah. Jeez. Also, Don says it's Gamescom Opening Night Live was the name of the, the show. Okay. Uh, and one of the things I, I questioned was that maybe Jeff Keighley had something of his own that he wants to start. He seems very good at doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that is just Gamescom. That remains to be seen. I don't think E3 is going to go away too quickly, but, I mean, even last year, like, we were kind of in a rush to go because we don't think it's going to be around forever. Yeah, there's no guarantees. Uh, And not that that should be necessarily a sad thing. Like, all that information that we uh, adhere to E3 for, like, will be found other places and other reveals and other presentations. That time we got to go to Chicago and go to the switch preview event behind closed doors yeah and you know we didn't have to go all the way to los angeles for that and it was a great time we got to play 
lots of games. We got to play Breath of the Wild within like 20 minutes of being in there. I think we played more games in that like one day than the, we did in all three days oh, of the yeah of the entirety of the the E3. That's so long. This is so strange. So the first Nintendo Direct covered 3DS and Wii games. I remember. That feels old. I, I, it's so funny to me, like, back then that I had such a negative response to this whole Direct thing. I was like, they didn't really do anything for me. I'll never watch this again, and now Directs, I crave. Yeah, it's funny. They had two in the latter half of 2011. That's when they started. They started on Ustream? You're lying to me. <laughs> I actually can believe that. Um, Making me feel real old And, now. like, it wasn't the, like, the sixth, <laughs> the sixth Direct was the pre E3 2012 direct. Was that the the like the Wii U one? Uh-huh. Okay. Well, I think it's kind of like uh when PlayStation started doing their directs and everybody's like this is weird, we don't like this stop. But like once you really like sit back and like evaluate it, the information you're getting, the reveals you're getting, it's better than waiting for E3 once a year to get all these big reveals and big information. You're getting yeah. nice little blocks of info spread out over across the, time. the year. So you're just a year full of hype. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the last State of Plays gave us a, a nice look at Final Fantasy VII Remake, which is a game that a lot of people just didn't think was ever coming out. Uh, yeah, is it still coming out? Yes. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, the coordinated head nod. Um, so, yeah, I don't think there's much more we can speculate on E3, but... Uh, I guess I'll end it with this. I'm really looking forward to the next Nintendo Direct. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Well, I think that brings us to our last segment, unless anybody else has to say anything about E3. So, oh, I think we're good to move on. All right. So we have two, uh, two, two replies to our question slot. Wow, we made fifty cents. Uh, yeah. Two Actually, we we quarters. only we 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 use pennies here. It's the penny room arcade. <laughs> um, well, so, no, we're not the penny arcade. <laughs> so uh, over here on Twitter, we got Santiago A Kingdom Hearts uh, asking the question. Forgive me if they've already confirmed this. But what role do you think Rossetti will play? I think the speculation is that it's the pickup <laughs> service, the rescue service. Yes, he will pick you up from wherever you are lost. Uh, Paul? When you irreparably destroy your island with terraforming, he will swoop in and reset the island, the landscape. Yeah, so I think that there will you be... You actually might be onto something yeah. with that. I think there will be more to this than just the rescue service. Like... Um, I'm not sure. I what remember when we were watching it, will take, watching it live, and I immediately thought it was Mr. Rossetti. But was it you who said his voice was different? Yeah, I mean, but that could also just be like whatever. Like I didn't feel like the voice was. Quite he has a as cohort, accurate. doesn't he? Yeah, so maybe it's one of them, and Rossetti is like the manager. Yeah. You know, like he's he's the god, but he doesn't do the. The dirty work. I think Paul's really onto something with him resetting your terraforming. I'm kind of hoping that that's a feature because I'll be really upset if I like really mess something up and then there's no way to like fix it. The whole reason or it takes the, a long time to fix it. The whole reason the whole rescue service exists, and they didn't even say this, is because you are going to probably be able to like break your town by locking yourself somewhere if you terraform too badly. So this is just to circumvent that. Unless, of course, all of the bad terraforming you did is by your house. Because that's where he takes you. I would love it to, like, the only way to get to your house is the rescue service. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think Rossetti's in the game. I think uh, he definitely plays a role uh, in in that. Um, though, obviously, he's not going to appear in the sense that, oh... Uh, you didn't save because that's not how saving works. Anymore. We auto save boys now. Yeah. Uh, he Santiago's got two other questions. What villagers are you looking forward to interacting with the most? So I guess None that's just them. like, what's your favorite villager, right? And I've already said I think mentioned Puck. Puck's the uh, ultimate ultimate penguin villager. Uh, so I'm looking forward to finding Puck once again in New Horizons. Uh, Daisy May. She is the new, uh, what are those plants called? <laughs> I'm losing it. 
the stock market, right? What are they called? Uh, turnips. Yeah, she's yeah, it's the turnip lady. <laughs> Why was that I'm so not like... sure what the animal is that she represents. Though. I can't remember. She's a pig, and she's got a little snot coming out of her nose. Boar. Oh, is she a boar? Which is a pig. Well, yeah, but it's more Big specific. But she's super cute. She's like um, it's like shoot, you. what's the boar in Clanid? Botan? Botan. Botan. Yeah, yeah, she's like Botan. Also, Don, I watched that 3DS conference live. That's where they announced Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. <laughs> I'll never forget it. Um, <laughs> well, not 4 Ultimate, to, but 4. The only thing it takes to make it like a, any like announcement big is just throw Monster Hunter in there. Yeah, that's okay. how you get my attention. Uh, the last question. In this thread, with post-direct knowledge in mind, are you most what are you most excited to do in their horizons? I think that's easy for me. Terraforming. I want to tear up my town. I want to get like a whole bunch of patterns going. I'm just thinking about like the kind of like lakes and rivers I can like craft mm -hmm. like into different shapes. You know, like Star Lake. Like, I guarantee there's going to be a Smash Bros. themed town where, like, there's just going to be a big Fire Emblem. Uh, not Fire. Well, maybe Fire Emblem, Smash too. symbol. Some big, yeah, big Smash Emblem, right, in the center where everything, all the, like, parts are, like, lakes. So, yeah, no, I think I could see that. I'm really excited to wake up on a Saturday morning, make a little cup of coffee, and then sit down to send passive-aggressive letters to all my villagers. Oh, this is going to be so <laughs> such a daily thing for me, like wake up in the morning, okay, time to do all my morning stuff in Animal Crossing. But actually, um, I mentioned this before, I remember back in like high school and college, you get a bunch of people over in, a, in my living room with their 3DSs and a copy of Monster Hunter. Yeah. And just like that in-person multiplayer where everybody has their own little screen in front of them and just like that like engagement i'm really looking forward to doing the same thing with animal crossing oh absolutely when new leaf came out i did a lot of that with uh with michaela and her brother carl it was just a lot of huddled together 3ds's just getting excited about talking to bill and seeing what bill's up to <laughs> and going to the island and catching fish yeah this game it's gonna be great for that uh, for me, I think the thing I'm most excited about doing is putting my furniture outside and just making lots of little cool areas in my town. Like I talked to Logan, I want to make like a shopping district and make that kind of separate from the residential area and then like build a path up to that. I, I'm excited about how all the layouts are going to work. A sports bar with all – or barcade. I want to barcade my town. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to build it so that it's inaccessible. To all the other villagers. Oh, one of the one of the rooms in my house is going to be the break room arcade. I decided instead that instead of drinking alcohol at this barcade, you're going to drink milk or tea, <laughs> iced tea. We did see Isabel drinking iced tea. Oh, uh, or coffee. Or coffee. Where's Brewster? Is he here? Um, we have another question from Baby Hands Jones. <laughs> That's a great name. Thank you. Uh, he says. Why do you want to play as Navi in the Breath of the Wild sequel? I didn't know I ever said that. Um, do you think her mechanics would be uniquely interesting? So I think the question is, would you like to play as Navi in the Breath of the Wild That's sequel? That's what I assumed. Yeah. Um, uh, otherwise, it's just a really confident assertion that, like, <laughs> bro, why do you want to play as Navi? Because obviously Navi's going to be in the game. So I have, a, I have some thoughts about this. Replace the beetle with Navi. That? I'd be into that because I actually like that item. You were saying. Uh, I could see this... Now, I do want a more traditional multiplayer in Breath of the Wild 2. That's something that we constantly talk about. But uh, I could see this also being like an assist mode type thing that you had in Super Mario Galaxy 2 and in okay. the 2D games. So, like, someone there, like, with a Wii remote, and they're pointing at the screen. So, like, Navi is what you point at the screen, and she can freeze enemies or pick things up. Or maybe she can has specific, like, puzzle-solving elements. Hey... You keep dying right now. Do you want me to play this segment for you, <laughs> you scrub? <laughs> so, yeah, I think this could be, like, a great feature for, like, a parent to be able to play with their kids. Like, the parent, obviously, is controlling Link or or, or maybe Zelda. Um, and then the child, you know, is playing the assist mode character. So, you know, great for bonding, that kind of thing. That's kind of how I see Navi working, if she would be a character in the game. Any extra thoughts on that? Just... I'd like her to be like the replacement for the beetle because that was a fun item. I do love the beetle too, so I would hope for that. 
Any thoughts from you? No, I sorry. This question is sort of left field. So you don't want to play as Navi? I <laughs> refuse to speculate on Breath of the Wild two until a later date. <laughs> no more Breath game two wild. <laughs> Uh, so that's wow. it for the question slot for this week. Thank you guys for submitting your questions. We always, well, we try to always get that tweet out like right before the show starts so that uh, those who answer their questions are probably listening and get to hear the answers live. Um, we usually do this show on Sundays. Uh, we didn't do it last week because uh, Paul was out of town and I was sleepy. Sorry. Are you? Um, but yeah, thank you guys for listening. I hope you like the the, the new additions to the set. Um, make sure to go over to Podcast Sources, Apple iTunes, uh, or I guess they call it Apple Podcasts now, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, anywhere you want to listen to us, you can find us. Um, make sure to like the video here on YouTube, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Also, if you're listening to this on a podcast source, you can watch us record it live uh, every Sunday night. And then we put the we'll put the show up on Podcast Sources shortly after, so it's usually yeah. right around the same time. Um but if you're ever feeling frisky, you can watch us do this live. Blay. Yeah, we'd love to, to chat with you. You can ask questions live and, you know, even skip the Twitter line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, we will get back to you guys next week. Uh, make sure to keep up with us. Follow me on Twitter. Bab, bab. Follow me on Twitter. <laughs> bab, bab, Follow Logan at Loggy Dubs. Follow Paul at Gunny Source. You at can bab, follow bab, us babs. as a collective at Break Room Arcade. And if you want to keep up the conversation with us, make sure to join our Discord server. There's a link to that in the description below. Right, Paul? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week. Don't break your backs. Break in the games. But for now, break time's over. Whoa. I'm really surprised. <laughs> I told you one time. Switch it up like that. <laughs> see you. <laughs>